Hi friends, I'm Andy Green, and today we're talking not just about our bodies, but to our bodies, because this is the Naked Man Podcast. This week, I'm pleased to be joined by sex scholar, speaker, best-selling author, and astrologer, Nadej. Nadej is a pleasure scientist who blends sex, neuroscience, and psychology with astrology into an intoxicating elixir that helps you become the best lover to yourself and others. Sounds yummy to me. Nadej first came onto my radar from my partner, Lily, who attended an event hosted by Nadej and previous Naked Man guest and pal, Danny Santos. I've wanted to talk with Nadej ever since, especially after I was fortunate enough to go to multiple virtual events hosted by Nadej that have already proved helpful and we're gonna get into those. Nadej is generous with their time and their talents, gifting body and sex positive content all over the place. They have their outstanding free newsletter that arrives in my inbox throughout the week, Nadej's free weekly sex Q&A on Instagram, but that's just foreplay. Nadej's mission is sexual liberation, coaching sex breakthrough programs with their clients to help eliminate shame and a world bursting with it. Today, Nadej has valiantly agreed to help me on my continuing journey to eradicate the shame I have surrounding my body and around sex, and hopefully you too, dear listener. As Nadej takes us through a body meditation, Nadej, welcome Hi. to the Naked Man Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's so wonderful to be here. Yeah, it feels like it's been a long buildup. Uh, it ha- it's I... been a lot of uh, professional foreplay, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to use that word too. I'm glad you did. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the best kind, you know, especially... LA, I think, is just like a decade of foreplay before anything exciting happens. At least that's my <laughs> life. Uh, that I, I well, mean, say that that rings yeah. true for sure. <laughs> Although I already regret saying that because foreplay is exciting. Foreplay can be good. Foreplay is all about the expect the the buildup. So finding fun in the foreplay is, I, and I, I think I have. I, I like. I feel like it's in our case. I've gotten to know you better and your work and been a part of some of your your classes. So I, I'm already like, I'm just a fan, uh, a quasi client. So yeah, thanks again for, <laughs> for doing this with me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited to be here and I love what you're doing with this podcast. And it's it's always fun to talk about this topic too. I can never talk about sex enough. So I guess I created <laughs> the right business for myself. <laughs> I, you, yeah, you stumbled upon the right thing and we're going to get to how the stumbling happened. But before that, Nadej, uh, you, you did this, uh, meditation form for a, a group of us previously. And it was so meaningful to me that I, I wanted to do it. And I also have multiple body parts that provide shame for me. So I knew I could do it again, but you have a body meditation that uh, you were going to lead me and any listeners out there. If you, uh, if, as long as you're not driving or, you know, whatever it is, like, uh, yeah, like basically here, take, take the show. It's yours now. And I (laughs) am ready to go on this journey with you. Absolutely. So one of the biggest things that I see from people is people being insecure about their genitals. They don't feel like their penis is big enough, or some folks feel like their penis is too big. Other people feel like their vulva is just ugly, which is something that we're actually taught to hate the vulva very rigorously in our culture. And then there's a lot of people who are intersex and who have a lot of genital shame as well because, you know, their bodies are, you know, they're told their bodies are not the norm when no body is the norm Um, and all bodies are unique and beautiful. So I wanted to set the intention with this uh, body meditation to really focus on loving your genitals today. That's where we're going to focus on. Um, And so before even diving in, I'm going to be using words like genital and pelvis because this is a meditation open for anybody and however you identify, whether you have a penis, a vulva, or your intersex. And we should all be loving our genitals because our genitals love us. So wherever you are, If you are driving, please pull over if you can. And I welcome you to start taking some deep inhales and exhales at your own pace. If you want to close your eyes, you can do that as well. If you want your eyes to remain open, I invite you to have a soft focus on whatever is in front of you. And continue taking a deep inhale at your pace. A deep exhale at your pace. 
Another nice inhale. And a louder exhale. Again, inhale. And exhale. And once more at your pace, take a nice inhale. And as you exhale, I want you to imagine that you are having a conversation with your genitals. Imagine your genitals are a person, a friend, someone who you're building trust with. The communication has been difficult, not because of you and not because of your genitals, but because of all the noise outside of your body that you don't have control over. As we sit with our genitals as our friend, I want you to imagine all the voices and messages that are not from your body are slowly winding down. They're becoming quieter. They're becoming softer. They aren't yours. And so they aren't relevant here. And take another big inhale at your pace. Another exhale at your pace. You and your genitals are friends. Take a moment to feel what friendship feels like. Friendship is appreciation, trust, love, connection. Take a moment to feel appreciation for you and your genitals. Appreciate the way your body looks naked. Appreciate the fact that you have genitals, that they can bring you pleasure. You can touch them. You can be with them. As you sit with your friend, your penis, your vulva, your groin. Let your genitals know that you're sorry for the times you didn't trust them. You're sorry for the times the outside noise made you think you weren't supposed to trust them or that you were already broken before you even knew what it meant to be whole. Take a moment to sit here and think about what trust means with this body part, your sex organ, a pleasure area, and an area that also gives you messages. Take a moment to forgive yourself for the times you misunderstood the messages from your groin. Maybe you had a rash. Maybe your penis wasn't working. Take a moment to realize that your genitals work exactly the way they're supposed to. And when your body is doing something that you don't understand, It's simply communicating with you. This is how we build trust with our friend that is our genitals. Think of the ways your genitals communicate with you. Are they telling you to slow down? Are they telling you that they need a break? Are they telling you that they need more appreciation? Take a moment and give your genitals the feeling and reassurance it might be telling you that it's been needing. Mm. 
remember that you love your genitals and your genitals love you. You are connected. You were given this body and it is the only body you have. Why not love it? Take a big inhale and exhale at your pace. What would you like to tell your genitals that you have not told them yet? Would you like to say, I'm sorry? Would you like to say, I appreciate you? Would you like to say, I love you? As you think of the message you would like to share, take a big inhale and on the exhale, imagine that feeling, trust, appreciation, love, floating down through your body, into your groin, into this pleasure center. You can reconnect to your groin at any time. You can share love and establish trust with your groin at any time. Because no matter what's happening outside of your body, your groin loves you too. Take another big inhale and exhale at your pace. The dial that we turned down to mute of all the voices and all the messages outside of your body, you can imagine it returning, coming back up and realizing those messages don't matter. They can be loud or soft, they can exist or not, but your conversation with your groin will always be sacred and it is yours. And it is the only truth. Take a big inhale. Pay attention to the noises around you, the feeling of your body, and at your pace, open your eyes and give yourself a big hug for taking this moment to love yourself and to love your genitals who already always love you. Aw. <laughs> How did that, that was, feel, Andy? <laughs> that was, uh, it felt like living a picture book in a really mm. wonderful way of just returning to yeah i mean returning to the body and and sort of i think especially with the groin area mm. and i mean i think just body in general we always get stuck on what's not working what's yeah or what's bothering us or what's what's noticeable is never the things that are you know maybe good or we appreciate and it was <laughs> totally. just really and it was just really nice to be appreciative of a place in my body that you know, probably more than any, I have had consternation and, and, and worries and angst and, and shame about, um, but also the best times of my life with too. Yeah. Right. So, um, it's a complicated relationship. And I think thinking of it as a friend is such a, I mean, I was sort of thinking of my penis as a plush toy that I was oh. just sort of like, uh, like yeah. it was like the eraser, the racer head baby, <laughs> uh, like, uh, but um, yeah, it was, your voice is very calming. Great. Oh, great I've voice. heard that before. You know, I yeah. back in the day when I was in university, I worked at a call center and I had several people ask me out on dates and I was like, well, one, I'm working and two, <laughs> um, no, you don't know me. <laughs> you don't even know what I look like. But that was when I discovered that I, I do have a good voice. So if I ever need to quit and become a phone sex operator or something, you know, or I'm ASMR, not above it. Yeah. ASMR. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. that seems like in your erogenous zone. Yeah. Um, yeah. work wise, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, but that doesn't surprise me, especially, I don't know. I think 
I think it's probably common throughout all genders or, or orientations, but like the, that, that emotional connection with someone who's helping you and also talking about intimate things. Like yeah. I've had a crush on every therapist I've ever had, you know? <laughs> oh, I've had like uh, so. a, I want to please you mommy type of thing with all my therapists. Like <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> give me gold stars, but I feel you. There's always some sort of connection that happens, you know? Yeah, no. Well, and it's, it's just, I mean, I think it's just vulnerability and vulnerability yeah. Uh, is, I mean, it's connection and that's intoxicating and it also can be confusing. And I know that's that, you know, when you were talking about the messages from, you know, sometimes maybe got missed messages or confused. Mm -hmm. And I think that was sort of, I was like, yeah, I think a lot of times that vulnerability, it does sort of just funnel into the groin yeah. like that, like, oh, oh, Nadege is being so nice to me right now. I love her. You yeah, know, it's like, it's totally. like, it's like, wait, <laughs> chill out. Like, like, or, but like, <laughs> Uh, and that can be true, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the the groin being the sort of vessel. But I think that's also kind of partly the outside noise of what, um, how how we've been in some way taught to love or yeah. or show our uh, show our affection, and it's a very limited one, you know, and potentially uh, you know it's dangerous, uh, you yeah. know, or or, um, but I yeah no, it was just. I don't know. I think especially even thinking about just sitting with the genitals and it not being about, I mean, yes, I was thinking about different sort of sexual things in those moments, like, but also it was more just like thinking it didn't feel sexual. And I think aside from like peeing, mm -hmm. you know, like going to the bathroom and sex, like, I don't think I'm just sitting there with my genitals. A and I think that's, unless I'm just sitting there and like, sort of like, Ugh, you know, yeah. um, or like, oh, okay, I have to trim or shave or whatever it is. Um, so Absolutely. I think it's you know, nice we only to, yeah. think about this area when it's when we're doing maintenance, you know, like grooming, like you said, or health, going to the urologist, gyne gynecologist, or just your doctor, or when something isn't working, or when we're, you know, it's either lack, maintenance, or self-conscious. And that's when we think of <laughs> our genitals. And in reality, you know... We can really think of them at other times and be intentional about it. I highly recommend people take a small mirror and look at what's between their legs and have that be somewhat of a regular practice to normalize what your body looks like. And also to go online and look up, not like, because it can be, you can easily access some porn that might reestablish the same limiting beliefs that we're trying to avoid. But there's a lot of artists who will do drawings of like all different vulva types or penises and things like that. And looking at those two to see how diverse bodies look. And um, and also if someone isn't really that educated about intersex too, you know, people who are intersex have a very large variety of how their body looks or what that even means, you know? And so wherever you fall on your gender identity or your body, you know, type, looking up these different ways people can all look can also be a really nice way to, to heal this, you know, disconnection that we're taught to have and self-hatred that we're taught to have. And, um, yeah, it's just it's a really fascinating thing because that's one of the things that I see all the time with um, with this with working with sex and doing sex coaching and all of this kind of stuff. It always comes back to the genitals. It does. Um, yeah, it starts. It all starts there, too. And yeah. I mean, but that's even well, it's also even just the creation of life is that's where it, you know, so yeah. it, it makes sense. It's all there. Yeah. Um, and I and I want you you brought up like sort of sta uh, standing in the mirror or looking in the mirror and looking at your genitals. And I, one of the things that was probably the most profound and also like scary things that you suggested at one of the sessions once mm -hmm. was to perform solo sex in front of a mirror as a yeah. way to practice self-love and to, to, to learn to love yourself more and appreciate your body. And yep. like that immediately was like, Oh, I don't want to do that. So, but I, so I immediately was like, but no, I, I have to try that. Yeah. Um. And and I I have and I think it I think it did help. I think I I have a little bit of well shame. I mean, there is a little bit of shame of like I think I had to I had to turn on porn just as like a it's like Pavlov's mm. porn just to sort of like ignite like oh I'm a, I'm aroused now. But then it doesn't yep. really I'm not paying attention to it anymore. 
Totally. But like, so I had to kind of, I guess that's like training wheels or something. No, but that's but, a really uh... smart thing that you did because we all have our subconscious arousal process. And so even with masturbation, there's going to be a formula, for lack of a better word, that you're using. And that especially once we enter adulthood, you know, where it's like, if you lay down in your bed at three in the afternoon, like maybe that's usually the time or something when you masturbate, like there, there are these habits exactly like Pavlov's law that you were talking about that will make your body realize what we're trying to do. And then a pattern mm -hmm. will take over and we do have patterns of arousal. And so, you know, when we're thinking of a practice of like masturbating in front of the mirror, it can feel intimidating just because you know, sex is intimidating and new ways of having sex are intimidating. But then also you're stepping outside of your arousal process. And so your body is like, well, I'm not aroused and this isn't usually how we get aroused. And also maybe you don't like looking at yourself in the mirror. Like mm. maybe that's a big part of the sex block, you know? And so you're also doing something that makes you feel the opposite of aroused. It makes you feel insecure. And so putting on porn as a little helper is genius, you know, because <laughs> you are telling your body like, okay, we are doing something different. We're having sex in front of a mirror. We don't usually do that, you know, or solo sex in front of a mirror, but because masturbation is sex people. But, um, mm -hmm. but then putting porn or putting something else there, or like for other folks who don't like porn, like taking out your vibrator or another tool that signals to your body what we're doing, that can be extremely helpful to make that experience feel less intimidating and to make it arousing so that your body starts activating the way it would in another, you know, masturbation type of situation something about that that I also realized that, you know, I think most of the time in my life, I'm activated by other people and in, in yeah. the sense that like I am turned on by someone else yeah. and not my I'm not turned on by myself necessarily or like, you know, it is just sort of a reaction or I'm just sort of like I'm and, and I and I that actually kind of made me sad. I was because mm -hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, no, like it. I mean, it would make like it helps to, I mean, feel that way. And I think that that relationship that that's the connection, right, that you're talking about, because mm -hmm. I'm disconnected. So it's sort of like I'm relying on, you know, it's almost like voyeuristic or just an mm -hmm. outside party to to bring me to my body rather than my just myself. Because yeah. um, I, I do know, like whenever uh, I don't know, it's not necessarily like if it comes up, my partner's like, oh, you can just, you know, you can just masturbate. I'm not into it. And it's not. Uh, she doesn't mean it as a anything, but I always that always makes me sad, yeah. you know, and sort of like and it's like, oh, that's like mm. feels like a punishment or something. Uh, and it wasn't like mm. a and it wasn't a big activated scenario, but it also it's like because I I don't have that connection with my body where it's just this like fun. I mean, it feels good. Yes, but it kind of mm. is that routine that you're talking about rather yeah. than. Like, I think it was a thing that I did to state anxiety or depression or just like that's what you do. Um, so it, I have that association. So it, it's kind of, it does break you out of that association, at least for me of what masturbation solo sex is. So it's just, uh, thank, thank you for, for suggesting that it like felt <laughs> revolutionary. Good. You know, it is, it, it can be. And I also just want to say too, cause I have some clients who, there are some people who don't like masturbation, never have. And so if you're someone listening and you're like, well, but I don't really like masturbation. I have great sex in my relationship or great sex with lovers, but I've never been a masturbator. Just know that that's normal and that you're not alone in that. I have had several clients who are in very happy long-term marriages and have never been masturbators. They don't really like to have solo sex and aren't inspired by it and it doesn't you know it's not a thing that's normal and also there are ways to use these you know self-touch and self-sensual and self-seduction practices without having masturbation so if you're someone who isn't a big masturbator Focus on a full body massage, get yourself some massage oil, find other ways to treat yourself and to romanticize and romance yourself because this art of solo sex and self-seduction, a big part of it is giving yourself, you know, erotic nourishment, but erotic nourishment doesn't have to be masturbation if that's not something that, if that's not you, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that's all okay. 
I, I think it's, I mean, it's an amazing point. And it's also just sort of the idea that, I mean, I think, well, I, I don't know if it's necessarily, a, I don't want to make a, a, a gender assumption, but I just know that in my, par my partner is so much better at self-soothing than me. Because like mm. I, I am, it's again, other people or just like, a, you know, media or whatever it is. And yeah, so like, mm. a, and I, that's what you're sort of saying. It's not just definitely, it's not just sex or pleasure. It's self-soothing and to yeah. get into, and, and that, you know, I think, I think there was a lot of either shame or just like, that's not a, a man thing growing up to like, you know, take a bath. Totally. Or, and it's you know, not, massage yeah, yourself no, it's and, certainly you know. not. So it's like, okay, yeah, I want to, you know, taking care of myself is, is the, who knew taking care of yourself feels good. What, <laughs> what <laughs> that sentence is insane, but like people, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's true. I think we're only now getting there, uh, hopefully. Um, and I, and I, you, you were talking about the things that kind of come up a lot with your clients and I wanted to sort of now segue into, yeah. you know, some of the work that you're doing and also how you got into that work. And I was wondering, like, are there any themes or, or, you know, I mean, you already mentioned a couple of themes that you have with your clients, but are there any other themes that might surprise people or might feel sort of, um, make people feel less alone or less, you know, cause I think a lot of it is we all think we're the only ones and that's not true. Mm, totally. I think one thing I see come up is with sexual fantasy. There are people who, when we hear the term sexual fantasy, people think of, you know, an elaborate, imaginative, sexual ability. And some people, when their sexual fantasy is literally just like imagining an erect penis and that turns them on, but it's not some elaborate situation. It's not some role play. It's not, you know, it's not a big visualization. And so I think that's another thing that I see often with people who you know, because in in coaching, we go over like, well, what is your arousal process? What? Because we don't ever stop to think about these things. We don't stop to define them. And then I'll hear people say, you know, oh, well, I don't have one or I don't sexually fantasize. And I'll be like, okay, well, tell me what you do think about then when you either have thoughts during sex or you masturbate or whatever. And there'll be a lot of people who are like, well, I just imagine like body parts or you know, penetration or specific sexual acts, but there's not a lot of other thought behind it. And they'll think that that's not sexual fantasy, just seeing an image. And I'm like, well, that is, mm. you know, wh whatever, whatever it is that you're thinking of and that turns you on, like that's your sexual fantasy. There is no right or wrong way to do that. Um, so that's another really fascinating thing that I see come up a lot in this work. Um, but um, I would say one of the biggest things is that everybody is unique and everyone has a taboo. So whatever you think your taboo is, you're not alone. And it also is healthy and cathartic to give your brain the space to fantasize about whatever your taboos are. So I welcome people to do that as well. Um, it's, it's a really healthy thing to do and it can help you release a lot of tension, but that's certainly something that I see. And I, I'd, I'd also say when it comes to sexual fantasies, also recognizing or just things that turn us on that might not be like, maybe you're watching a show and there's, you know, a really problematic relationship, but it turns mm. you on, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I'm thinking right now of this really great sci-fi show called, uh, what's it? Foundation on Apple TV plus. Oh, and there's okay, yeah. this emperor who's a clone and he's cloned himself. And so he, he will forever be the emperor. And the way that he does this is he has a, um, and she's like this mommy slash confidant slash, like she's so, so many things, but he, this robot who basically makes sure all the clones grow up and they maintain integrity as this emperor. And in um, season two, it, things get a little bit sexy between the emperor and this um, this robot, this robot Ooh. woman. And I'm immediately like, oh, my God, this is like a mommy dommy, like all, you know, all of my training is is spiking up. But I can imagine like someone at home maybe watching this and thinking like that turns me on. But it's so problematic that like the mother figure would, you know, be having sexual relations with someone. And 
whenever the, you know, so when it comes to sexual fantasies or the things that turn you on, I'd say one, there's no right or wrong way to have sexual fantasies. And two, we all have taboos. So if you step on something that turns you on and and it's a little taboo, studies actually show that it's healthy and cathartic to give yourself the space to imagine that um, and just go there in your own brain. You're not going to hurt anybody and you aren't hurting anybody. And you should live your, like give yourself permission to to just experience that and then release it and not make it mean something. Because I think that's one of the things with sex is like you don't have to make everything mean something. You don't have to um, get to the root of, oh, I watched this TV show and now mommies turn me on and I'm a bad person. (laughs) By the way, mommies are hot and we should normalize mommies being really hot and multifaceted people. But... um, (laughs) But, you know, just sort of like giving yourself the space for grace and not having to define everything. There are certainly things that might be sexually holding someone back or obstacles, but you can also just have the space to be a person, you know? Yeah. That's that's funny. That makes me think of just like high school Andy and like had tears of like people that I would allow myself to fantasize about. And like the people that like, I think the people that I was like, in love with i was like oh i can't i can't masturbate about them because that's naughty or bad right and, or like some bullshit like that and it, but like but what does that say about the other people like the judgment i was putting on but also it was just like so it was it was yeah it was even just putting on like a value with it or that it meant something yeah. uh, rather than it was just play and fantasy um yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and that, in fact, it might be healthier and cathartic to like, let's oh, yeah. just say you have a crush on your best friend's husband or something, because I see this happen a lot <laughs> with some clients, <laughs> especially single clients who will get anxiety about like, you know, oh, I have a, a I have a crush on like this unattainable person. And um, and maybe it is like your friend's husband or something or your friend's spouse and like it's okay to masturbate about that. And and it can even like release things for yourself Mm. and get things, you know, out. And if you repress that or try to shame yourself for that, you know, that can be one, a lot worse and a lot harder to deal with. It's going to kind of compound the shame. And then also if you're someone who has a crush on an unattainable person, think of why you have that crush. It's probably because this your friend's spouse, for this example, is an archetype of the kind of person you would like to date. How can we take the positives from this crush rather than saying to myself, oh, you know, it would be cheating or disrespectful or whatever to masturbate about this. And also keep in mind that your brain is a weird and funny place. So a lot of images will come through when you're self-pleasuring or when you're aroused, that may not make sense. I mean, I've had times where I've thought of a friend who I love but wouldn't date and didn't really ever think like, oh, I mean, you're beautiful, but I'm not attracted to you. But then when I'm, you know, enjoying my sexual experience, maybe I'll think of them as it like goes through and I'm not going to stop and make meaning of that. I'm just going to let it go. You know what I mean? It's like (laughs) we can let things exist. And then if there are sexual fantasies or things that are maybe bringing you down or attractions that are bringing you down, like how can you look into what's happening and say, okay, well, what is this showing me about what maybe I want in the future Mm. um, that I don't have now? Because usually that's what that's saying. Jealousy is like that too, by the way. We're only jealous of things or people who have what we want. We're never, you know, like if you're a chef, you're not going to be jealous of your writer friend who gets a book deal. But if you're a writer and your friend gets a book deal and you don't have one, of course, you'd be jealous. You know, (laughs) if you're single and your best friend's spouse is this amazing, you know, attractive person, you're only human. Maybe you're jealous and aroused, you know, but that's only because someone has what you want. How do you intelligently and maturely use this information and also love yourself in the process and give yourself the space for grace to be a human being and to be imperfect? Nadesh, you're awesome. Uh, oh, and, and, and yeah, not, yeah, not to, I mean, police our thoughts and not to, yeah, yeah I think that especially, yeah, like they don't mean anything a lot of times. Um, and yeah. I, I wanted to, I mean, I feel like 
how did we get how did Nadege get to this point is what I'm I'm <laughs> I'm wondering. I'm like, because I know when I was reading, you know, prepping for the episode, I read that growing up even that you were less embarrassed about bodies and sexual behavior. Yeah. Uh yeah. with your and you were sort of the <laughs> emotional like sound bird. child. Yeah. yeah, you were it, it kind of felt like you were Otis from sex education. Like it kind of felt like oh, that was the, the <laughs> such a compliment. I love <laughs> I love that show and I love Otis. Um no the uh, thank you. That's a great question. You know, growing up, I was definitely someone. It's funny because growing up, I was very rambunctious. And so if I had a crush on you, you knew I had a lot of inappropriate behaviors and a lot of attention seeking behaviors. But I think that like attention seeker part of me also made me really have a different relationship to embarrassment. And mm. I did not get embarrassed about things like sex or bodies or having a crush. I would be very vocal about these things, which definitely got me into trouble or into embarrassing situations. But at the end of the day, I, I didn't carry those memories the way I noticed other people would, where mm. I was able to kind of let things go or not make myself wrong for for certain things. Um, and then as I got older, when I like in high school, because when I was in like junior high and even elementary school, I was very curious. I was very outspoken. So I got myself into a lot of trouble. But um, which if sex was normal and talked about, I don't think I would have gotten into so much trouble. But because sex is taboo and impolite, I got myself into a lot of trouble. And then when I was in high school, I simmered down a little bit. But I also became sort of a soundboard for people like I had a lot of friends get herpes and I was the one that they would tell. And these were people from different friend groups, people who wouldn't know each other. And I was also I'm always been I love friendship. So I've always been someone who's kind of dipped their toe in a lot of different friend groups. And um, and then when I got into college, that trend really continued, but on a scale that was a lot more noticeable. And I'd say at that point, that's when I started to be more of an Otis um, ah. and less of a just regular hormonal Friend. teenager. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but, um, but in college, um, I was the, the organizer of an, uh, a club called queer women at Berkeley. And then I was also studying sex. And so I was someone who at that point had a little bit more intention with how I was carrying myself. But yeah, same thing. People would come up and they would ask me these questions and or talk to me about things. And I loved talking about sex. And it was really interesting because in that area of my life, it was like another personality would kick in that was very open minded and non judgmental and able to hold space. But if someone was talking to me about politics, if someone was talking to me about it's just something else. I kind of was just a normal person and a normal Nadej. But when it came to sex, I wasn't, um, I don't know. It was like a whole different per side of my personality would come out and I would just be able to really hold space and not feel any need to gossip, not feel any, need, you know, it was like a very different side of me would would come out and that was sort of how I started to really have the intuition that this was something that I needed to pursue I think on a professional level and um, and so I started that journey as a sex scholar really by writing and writing articles on the internet and that really took off and more and more people you know I one of the articles I wrote on the internet um, I think it was about the astrology. Uh, it was about Virgo. And that's a whole other conversation. But if you're a Virgo and you're listening and astro culture told you you're a virgin, you're not. You're actually a fertility goddess. And there was a very specific um, uh, erasure of goddess culture over the last 2000 years. And so the fact that we now think of Virgo as a virgin is way more indicative of patriarchal dominance than actual history and what that constellation has meant. You're a fertility goddess, not a virgin oh. at all. But that's a whole other <laughs> tangent. But someone had read that article and reached out to me and was like, can I hire you as a coach? And I was like, I don't I, like I was like, I can refer you. But she was very adamant that she really wanted to work with me. And so I was like, all right. And so I opened I created a little 30 day program and I started working with her and I loved it. And 
realized like, wow, I always really was gifted in this area. And so from there, that was how I started working with more people and shifting into doing events and and working with community because I realized one, I had the bandwidth for it. I really loved it and that it was just so fulfilling um, and I could really understand people on a whole other level. And so, you know, I've been in this field for over 10 years now. Um, so I definitely myself went from someone who was I did not like the way my vulva looked necessarily. Um, I also I used I love the taste of my own secretion, but I would be so self-conscious about that. Like if anyone found out, they'd think I was so gross. Now I like my ex-girlfriend, I would like steal her underwear out of the laundry and I didn't even care. You know, <laughs> now I'm like, this is the life I live. But um <laughs> But it took, you know, it takes time to get from wherever you are in your shame spiral to where you want to be. But it also is possible. And um, and yeah. And so it was a lot of like self-work and then also community work and being of service and just showing up and and getting uncomfortable and getting over my own imposter syndrome and realizing like I can help people and I'm good at this and I want to do this and I keep getting opportunities. You know, the universe keeps showing me (laughs) to do this. And, um, and yeah, and it's, it's been a really beautiful experience. And I, I, I can't help but like wonder, like, what do you attribute that sort of openness? You say it's almost like a different side of you when you talk about sex and now maybe it, it's more streamlined and that's you throughout all topics, you know? Um, but I was just wondering like how, you know, were, were you just, I mean, it sounds like it's a natural gift or a natural thing, but do you, do you, have you gone back and like, you know, traveled through time and been like, wh- why, why was I more comfortable than other people or what? You know, what could you attribute that to? Is it your French parents? Is it, you know, could have been. Yeah. My parents were French. They were artists as well. So I grew up in a very like one of the first lessons I heard from my parents was you could be whatever religion you want. You can have whatever career you want and um, and you don't need to get perfect grades. That was one of the first I remember my mom actually sitting me down when I was going to I don't remember if it was entering high school or junior high, but sitting me down and literally saying, you know, your dad and I made a commitment to ourselves that like you should work hard and get good grades and like not fall behind, but you don't have to get straight A's to to feel loved in this family. And um, and so I think part of it came from them. Um, and also when I got into high school, my mother sat me down and gave me a very extensive, you know, sex ed type of talk that Mm. was very loving and, and kind. Um, (laughs) and all I got from the conversation was, I think I should go on birth control because I want to be slutty. My mom was like, well, that messes with your hormones. So let's see, you know, um, (laughs) like, let's see, let's see if you have people who want to date you and then we'll talk about that. Um, but I also think part of it was my personality. You were able to say that sentence, like when you said like, oh, I want to be slutty. I want to be on birth control. Did you say that to your mom in that conversation? I said, I want to be on birth control because I want to be with a lot of guys. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, sorry. I was just like, I think that's just amazing and indicative of your relationship. Totally. No, I was really lucky with them. So I think that that made a huge difference. And I also, when I look back on my journey, I feel like a lot of it was also very faded and very much like I meant to be doing what I'm doing because I was, you know, my family, they grew up in other countries and those countries are like, I mean, France is known to be pretty liberal and open um but they have their shame and they have their sex negativity too you know and also the majority all my family lives in france and i'm so lucky that they're all wonderful loving people but i grew up in america where my only family was my mom my dad and my sister and so i didn't have what other people have where well what is my aunt gonna think what's my grandma gonna think what is Mm. you know i i definitely think about that and i love all of all of my extended family But I was in a situation in America where I did not have to think that a community might reject me for being my rambunctious self um, and and chasing after things. And so I think that certainly helped big time when thinking of the openness that I had um, with my own self. 
And then with other people and that other personality, it's so funny because um, I like there would be people who like I could literally have not liked a person, but then they would come to me with a sex problem. And all of a sudden it was like I saw them as something different. And mm. and I think that was just a gift I was given because I was meant to do this work, too. And I'm so grateful for that because judgment, when we judge others, we're judging ourselves. You know, you're not like judgments you have of others. That's you, baby. <laughs> that's not them. <laughs> Even if you may be right that like someone is oppressive or rude or something, it's still, you know, just like you're only jealous of the thing that you want in someone else. You're only judging another person because they have the audacity to go after something you want or they have mm. the audacity to live out loud with something you're suppressing, something you're insecure about in yourself. And so when we stop judging others, we stop judging ourselves. And I was so grateful for when it came to sex, this like, because I would notice it where I would be a regular person, you know, having my judgments or my gossip, just like everybody else does. But then when it would come to sex, I would have this different, very, like foundational set of no, I'm not going to make fun of that. That's not funny. I'm not going to shame that. That's not shameful. And when I, I really noticed that in college, because that's when it became really apparent. And that's when I started to realize, like, I want to be like that in all the areas of my life. You know, if someone's talking about money or politics or something else that doesn't have to do with sex and relationships, I want to be able to show up as an open-hearted, open-minded person. And I started to really realize that the way to do that was to stop. Like when I would hear a judgmental thought in my head, I would literally say the word stop in my head. And then I'd find mm. some sort of thing to compliment. Like, you know, maybe I don't like this man ordering at Starbucks because he's talking down to the barista. And my first thought is like, he's an asshole and all men are like this. And then I'll stop and be like, <laughs> well, no, uh, stop that thought. And you know what? I like his sweater, you know, <laughs> fuck his attitude, but I like his sweater <laughs> and finding just something. And that would help me stop. And I would realize like, you know, thinking of that thought, cause I would have that thought a lot growing up. All men are like this. Whenever I would see like, uh, a cisgendered or someone who I perceived as a cisgendered straight man behaving in some sort of way, I would go back to this limiting belief that I had of all men are like this. And then I would stop that thought and think of all the men, including my own dad, who's incredible and is like the most supportive, wonderful person. All these examples that that thought isn't true and that this person is has privilege. That's true. But like, where is like maybe they're being condescending to the barista because they've had a horrible morning and the barista genuinely did mess up and and they're, you know, just this embodiment of a patriarchal man. And I have my own, you know, bad experiences with that. But that doesn't mean that the judgment is true. And then I even when I got deeper in that would realize like when I was dating women, I would have this big, big fear that I don't want to treat her the way men had treated me and would hold myself back in my own masculinity. And when I stopped judging people who I perceived to be cisgendered straight men for behaving in certain ways, and when I stopped and started really interrupting the belief that all men are like X, Y, and Z, I noticed that my ability to connect to my masculinity and show up in queer relationships was so much better because I was no longer worrying that I was going to replicate patriarchy, which is actually thinking to your question before of like, what are things I see a lot in my practice mm -hmm. with queer folk? That's a big one, you know, where I have been oppressed. I know what that feels like. I've been abused. I know what that feels like. I don't want to do that to you, but then the shadow of that is I'm not going to stand up for my boundaries because I don't want to be perceived the wrong way. Um, I'm not going to communicate well because I don't want to be misunderstood. And so this beautiful intention of I don't want to hurt you the way people have hurt me turns into I hurt me and I hurt me and I hurt me, you know. Mm, that actually, that resonates a lot in, in terms of, yeah, I think I have that, you know, I put that on myself too. And then I think I, yeah. in some way, create it through lack of uh, communication or, or just different things. Like, I'm just like, oh, wait, I, 
you know, it's not that I'm, I'm becoming the person I don't want to be, but it just like, I'm so worried. I'm like so worried or so in my head, but I'm also, yeah, either letting someone hurt me or I'm certainly just hurting myself over and over again because I'm, I'm stuck in that and giving that narrative power. Um, I, uh, I, I feel like there's so much to go on here and, but I, I want to, I want to ask if there's actually anything in this realm that embarrasses you or remains hard mm. to talk about. Like what's your next mountain? <laughs> I think professionally, the next mountain that I'm climbing is figuring out how to like create a bigger impact and be of more service and, um, and do that in a way that like, because right now I work one-to-one -one with people and I love that, but I want to serve more people and, and grow pleasure science because we really need this work and collaborate with other people in my field and really just grow the message. And so sometimes I wonder like, oh, well, can I be as impactful, you know? And so that's a professional mountain that I'm undoing because I think, because one, we grow faster in groups. So when we talk about sex in groups, it is very powerful. And, um, and then a personal mountain in thinking of like my own erotic wellness that I'm going through. Let me think about it for a second. Um, you know, is having the time to date and run a business. Like mm -hmm. I have definitely in my own personal life, like, because I love what I do so much and I, you know, it's, it's a true pleasure. I can sort of say like, oh, well, I'm not going to work hard in this other area, you know, in, in dating. Um, and then realizing, you know, one of my favorite phrases is manifestation is demonstration. If you want to bring something into your life, you have to be demonstrating to the universe or God or goddess, whatever you believe, you have to be demonstrating that you want that thing. And so for me right now, I'm single, which I love being single. It's like probably my favorite state of being so far. <laughs> um, it's and, you know, I truly believe that when you get into a relationship, it's because this person is making your life better than you were able to make it on your own. Um, but sometimes I, I wonder like, oh, well, don't get too good at quote unquote being single because I also love connection. And so, you know, realizing like I recently started getting on the dating apps again because I was like, well, I need to demonstrate that I am opening the door to the thing that I want. I'm not expecting it to just pop out of a hole in the ground and be like, hi, I'm your new lover and I'm here. And uh, I just I happened to wander into your backyard, you know, <laughs> and That'd be we're compatible. Scary. I know that would be. Yeah, that's we're not trying to call that in. But <laughs> um, but, you know, like and I think that's one of the things there's. Folks can so often see, and I see this with so many other sex experts where people think like, oh, because of what you do, you've made it and you don't have any, you know, and, and that we're all on our personal journey and that that's really beautiful and we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses and that the most powerful thing you can do is figure out what is step A. If from where I am now to where I want to go, what's step A? What's that small step? How can I demonstrate that I want this thing and, you know, take it from there? Uh, I love that. And, and Nadej, thank you for, I think this is my step a for oh. into the, into, into befriending my genitals, befriending this conversation, removing the teeth or the, whatever the stigma around it, maybe it's step BC. Maybe I need to give myself some more credit, but I just want to thank you so much for, you know, leading the breadcrumbs and, yeah. and, and joining us for this conversation. Uh, God, I want to talk to you forever after. Like, I'm just like, I just want to hear you talk. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Naked Man podcast. What body parts are you learning to love? Share what you learned during your body meditation at Naked Man Pod on socials. If you want to stay naked, make sure to follow and subscribe to the Naked Man podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Next time on the Naked Man podcast, I sit down to get naked. As a nude model for a life drawing class at Pasadena Life Drawing, be careful what you name your podcasts. In the meantime, as my dad always says, be sweet. <laughs>